50 years of just a minute. Nicholas Parsons in conversation with Paul Merton. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Merton. Welcome to the Radio Theatre here in the heart of the BBC in London. We are here to celebrate a remarkable anniversary. 50 years ago, on December the 22nd, 1967, the pilot episode of Just a Minute was broadcast on the then recently named Radio 4, formerly the Home Service. Since that initial broadcast, there have been a further 974 episodes of Just a Minute. But even more remarkably, one man has appeared in every single one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> now, Nicholas, uh, yes. I mentioned then mm -hmm. just a minute start in 1967. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to those years. Mm -hmm. um, in 1967, you'd won the Radio Personality of the Year Award... That's right. ..for a show that was called Listen to This Listen Space. Listen to This Space, which I had created, that's uh, right. And you were looking for a, another show to sort of extend well, your comic in, abilities? in that show, I now was introducing, I was being rather po-faced, introducing, not doing much comedy, because mm -hmm. I had the other comics getting all the funny lines. And I, I wanted to get back and do some improvised comedy. Uh, a friend of yours, Ian Messeter, you That's spoke right. to him, and Ian talked to you about reviving an old idea that he'd done before on the BBC. I asked him if he had any other ideas, and he said, I had this programme called um, One Minute Please, which we did during the war, it was very successful, I discovered Gerald Hoffman and others, and he said, I've rehashed it and called it Just a Minute. So I took the idea up, and they said, yes, he commissioned it. And so the, so you, the pilot's been commissioned. What was the pilot like? The pilot was a disaster. <laughs> a complete and utter disaster. You see, originally, I wasn't going to be chairman. Mm. I was going to be Jimmy Edwards. Because you were looking to be a panellist. Yes, rather than I wanted to get back. I was going to be, want to do improvised comedy again. And Jimmy was never free on a Sunday when they wanted to record the pilot. And David Hatch came to me and... Um, and it's entirely thanks to him that we got a series. Mm. It was his very first job, actually, from the, and he joined the staff. And uh, he came to me and said, Nicholas, we're never going to get Jimmy on a Sunday. Would you do me a favour? You be chairman for the pilot. And I said, no, no, David, please, I don't want to do that, and I'm not right for it. I don't think I can do that job. And I pleaded with him, please. And he said, I'll do a deal with you. You do the chairmanship for the pilot, and if we get the series, you can go on the panel. So you, you were the chairman for the pilot, but the rules weren't particularly well defined. No, the point is that Ian Messeter is a great inventor, but I don't think he's so good on production. And he had this idea, which was very good, but he inhibited everybody. As you know from playing the game, it's fiendishly difficult mm. to keep going with those restrictions of hesitation, repetition, deviation, and also to try and be funny. Mm. And we had rounds where you couldn't use plurals, another round where you couldn't use the definitive article. It got so bitty-bitty, it was all over the place. Mm. And it really was a disaster. And the BBC didn't want it, naturally. But young David Hatch, who just joined the staff, saw potential, and he thought, if I change this and change that, we might be able to get a series. But there was one thing they liked about the pilot. Yes. Which was you being the chairman. <laughs> well, uh, David came to me and he said, uh, I've got a series. I know my promise to you to put you back on the panel. He said, but the one thing they quite liked in the pilot <laughs> was your chairmanship. <laughs> and I said, but David, I was awful. He said, I know, but so was everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> thing is that I, I'm an actor, and I was, think I played it rather like an actor doing a job as a presenter. Mm -hmm. I wasn't relaxed and easy and having fun and so forth. So you were playing the part of a chairman rather That's, than being a chairman. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, I found a way to do it, and I think I must have been doing something right, because I'm still doing it after 50 years. <laughs> That's the beginnings of Just a Minute. Let's go back to the mm. beginnings of Nicholas Parsons and the show business career. Wow. What was the, what, can you remember when you first wanted to be an actor, that first, the, oh. when that, the first thought came to your mind? Well, I think from the earliest age I can remember. I just loved fooling around and showing off. I irritated my parents, made my older brother very angry. Certainly as a, as a child, as you were growing up, this was definitely an ambition you wanted to follow, but your parents weren't particularly keen on oh, the no, idea. Oh, no, no, no. When I was older, and my parents said, well, what are you going to do for... Um, when you leave school, 
And I said, well, there's only one thing I've ever wanted to do. You know, I want to be an actor. My father, it was very succinct. He was a typical of the period. He said, well, don't be ridiculous. He said, that's not a proper job. And I said, well, there are people you see in the theatre and in the films and the cinema. Oh, he said, yes, you'll get these sort of rather exceptional, eccentric people doing that sort of thing. But it's, it's, it's not a real life. You do it for fun, the amateur. My mother was horrified. Mm. Then when she went to the theatre, she thought everybody in the theatre, she called it, was either debauched, depraved or degenerate. <laughs> so she knew the theatre pretty well then. Yeah. <laughs> I remember saying to her one day, I said, Mother, you would love going to the theatre. You admire people like Laurence Olivier and Peggy Ashcroft and Rafe Richardson and others. I said, do you think they're all like those people you describe? She said, no. But isn't it a pity they have to work with those sort of people? (laughs) (laughs) So let's let's jump forward now to you're 16 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, You are, by your own sort of words in your autobiography, English, middle class, uh, your father's, you know, doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the age of 16, you do a a rather remarkable thing. Uh, I don't know what my parents were thinking. It's because I was dyslexic and they didn't know what it was then. They thought I was a bit slow. And though I'd got through all my exams, because I've always been made capable with my hands making things and so forth, and repairing, and had a lot of tools, they said, why did you become an engineer? Well, if I wasn't going to be an actor, I didn't give a dang what I did. And the next thing I knew, they got in touch with relations in Scotland, got in touch with friends, and they arranged for me to begin an engineering apprenticeship on Clydebank, with a firm called Drysdale, so they made pumps. 16-year-old English. 16-year-old. And there I was on a train during the war, the blackout going up there. When I arrived, I had much more of an English public school accent then than I do today. Mm. It looked a bit different like that, you know. A lot of people did, actually. And, uh, they must have thought you were from another planet, weren't and, they? Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't understand what they were talking about to begin with. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you, Nick, I'll you, I'll you, I'll come oh, no, Jimmy, Jimmy, hey, come over here, Nick. It's all right. You, we'll teach you to get your own study. Can you still do the accent? <laughs> In retrospect, it, 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 I think you said, it was, it, it was a making of me in a way, because mm. I knew if I was going to survive in that environment, a complete oddball to them all, I had to make a rapport with them. Mm-hmm. And, and, they, and they came to me one time, I remember, they said, hey, Nick, can I ask you, are you a boss's man? And I sensed what they were after. I said, oh, no, no, I don't know the bosses at all. Well, of course I knew them. They got me the job. Mm. Uh, they said, oh, that's, that's OK, because, I mean, you, you, you make us laugh, you, you're mucking there, and you, you, you can be one of us, that's great. Because if you were a boss's man, you'd be out. Mm. You'd be finished. <laughs> We'd crucify you. I mean, I mean you, I have, you, have, and all that, you yeah. have said that it has sort of like, it did really shape your character. And I it, think so. And it helped you to build a sh- you know, to the confidence to take on a show business career. Let's, let's go back now to the, mm. the, the early days of just a minute because we have an extract here from the second ever show. This is from the 29th of December 1967. The subject is waffles, and the first voice you hear will be that of Sheila Hancock. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin. The subject is waffles. Can you talk to us about them for just a minute, starting now? This is something at which this team is expert, waffles. It is a way of talking to fill in time, which is a load of rubbish and which Kenneth Williams is particularly adept at. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Deviation, am I going to sit here and be told I talk a load of rubbish? (laughs) One of the greatest illumin... Oh, I mean, no. So why are you challenging? (laughs) Why are you challenging? Because it's a disgrace deviation, it's No, no, I'm sorry, she did actually repeat particular twice, but, you, but it's too late now. You charged for deviation, and she wasn't deviating from the subject, as the way I see it, because she can interpret you, this in You the passed way. your opinion on General Mao, I'd pass in your, my opinion on, on you. You. <laughs> you are extremely rude, and you're a such a cake hole. <laughs> there you are. I think that was I'm going to have to come here to be insulted. Should, you can be insulted anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the wonderful Sheila Hancock. Oh, my God, I'm getting so old. <laughs> but, you see, I, I trade on it because he makes jokes at my expense and the number of laughs he's got in just a minute when he's made a joke about me and my age. But, I mean, it's so funny hearing that clip. I was hearing it backstage. 
I mean, he was so aggressive on the show. <laughs> they all were. Mm. They were absolutely vile to one another. A lot of it was cut out. And, and, you know, women wouldn't appear on the show. The reason I was on so much is because so many people wouldn't come on. <laughs> no, he, he can I interrupt the there? No, it wasn't. It's because she was so good. <laughs> and you know, and you had the character and the strength to stand up to them and give them as good as they got. Yes, you weren't phased by them, were you? I, I was sometimes, but on the whole I wasn't, no, because I knew them all off stage and I, I, I knew them well. But it was, it was quite a tussle. And then, funnily enough, after they all died, one by one, I think I'm the only one left standing, me and Nick. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but then they, they you know, they, they gradually dropped off and I, I decided not to do the show uh, anymore because I miss them all so much. I love them all very much, particularly Kenneth. And um, even though Nick was still there, it felt kind of different. So for a long while I didn't be part of it. And then I listened to it and the whole nature of the show had changed. And it was more stand-ups like you, Paul, mm. and youngsters. And it was, it took on an entirely new lease of life with the different people that took over. Mm. And it worked. I mean, everybody has their own particular way of playing it, really, don't they? they? Do. I mean, yes. I think when it sort of started, Nicholas, it was sort of... The idea was more that, you know, along the lines of somebody will now give you a talk about the mm. end of the Roman civilization or something. So serious radio talks was the kind of thing that you were mimicking, I think. It has evolved, you see, but I have this great theory, which I'm sure Paul, you will endorse, that if you're going to have something to make it work, you've got to keep on it and think about it and find little ways of adjusting and honing and altering them. And over the years, we have adjusted the, the rules and the regulations and so forth. I think all credit to you, Nick. I don't honestly think it would have survived without you holding it together. No, I, really I agree. Don't. No, no. But funnily enough, you haven't changed all that much. Well, you, you hear me in those early ones. I do think I sounded a little bit pompous and so forth. But well, um... no, I, th I thought you sounded more or less the same, except <laughs> loud. <laughs> thing about Nick, I, I'm here to say, sometimes both of us are getting a bit old, and I see Nick arrive and I think, mm, gosh, you know, he is getting a bit old. And, <laughs> and then he gets on the show, and it's amazing, because it isn't easy chairing the show, No, is indeed. It? No. I mean, you've got to listen to every word, you've got to be firm. It I is actually know. the biggest effort of concentration that I do. It must be. I mean, I concentrate, I realise, in quite a different way to any other job I do. Right. And I'm following everybody's every word so that if someone mentions a word and 50 seconds later they come up with the same one, I can say immediately. Because if I don't keep it moving, it's all gone. You, you, you say that um, you, you, your, your memory was honed when the years you were doing repertory. Uh, oh, that from... had all helped. No, I think my memory was... I had a good memory, which was very good in doing repertory. We were rehearsing and learning the part in one play during the day and we're playing a different part and a different play at night. Mm -hmm. It was very demanding. Well, they, they say the brain is like a muscle, isn't it? And so yeah. the more you use it, the, more, the better Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not in a show, I find that I'm getting a little bit more forgetful. Mm -hmm. And then I get back to the discipline of having to learn a part, or even if I'm not in the show, sometimes I'll learn a poem a day just to keep that, that muscle going. I have a miracle. wonderful story about Kenneth, because when yes. I was in rep, Kenneth came round and guessed it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, Kenneth, you know, when he was younger, had aspirations to be taken seriously as a, as a serious actor. Yes. And he was a very, very good actor. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was only later when he put on the character voices, which became like caricatures, and he never respected, as you know from his diaries, that work he did. In fact, when he got his first job, he didn't really want to do it with the, in the Hancock's half hour, because he wanted to stick to acting. I'd seen him at the Arts Theatre in St. Joan, he played the Dauphin, mm -hmm. and he won an award. He was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a, um, a thriller, Kenneth was playing a very nasty character. At one point, he, I was playing the, the hero character. He pulls his gun, and he le I leap forward, press the gun, he shoots himself in the stomach, and dies an agonizing death. Now, th on this particular occasion, he produced the gun, we did that. Now, if a gun doesn't go off, the audience here, click. <laughs> on this occasion, I leapt forward, he pressed the trigger, and we heard click. <laughs> Well, when something as dramatic as that goes wrong, your adrenaline works a million to one. I knew we had to do something, so I grabbed the gun. I said, "Sick, come on, keep moving. Go on, go on, keep moving. Yeah. And I think Kenny guessed what I was trying to do. Go on. 
Kenneth had this inspiration. He was a great ad-libber. He said to me, throw it at me. Throw it at my stomach. <laughs> I thought, well, anything now. So I took the gun, I aimed it, so I said, take that, you swine! And he clutched his stomach, and he went into his full, agonising death scene. I said, oh, you got me. I'm going. I'm going. You never told me the gun was poisoned. <laughs> Sheila Hancock. So there's Sheila. She's the longest-serving female panelist. Absolutely, uh, let's, yes. let's turn now to the longest-serving male panelist. Um, he he made his Just a Minute debut in 1981. Uh, he didn't become a regular until 2002 for reasons that we'll go into. Um, but let's first hear him from February 2009. The first voice you will hear is a very close friend of mine, and then the the person that's becoming on next is the person challenging. The subject is endorphins. Paul, you've got a correct challenge. You have 39 seconds. Tell us something about endorphins starting now. Well, they're beautiful creatures. Flipper was my favourite. You could bounce a <laughs> beach ball on his nose, swim around the sea, a bottlenose variety, and people would say, where's he heading for? And then they would surge across the oceans and he would uh, lead them... Giles' challenge. This is very droll, but it's a slight on your diction. <laughs> it's an insult to you. You're, you're famous for your diction. You're only here, I know, because you knew Lord Reith personally. Uh, <laughs> And, yeah. When he appointed you and Al Valadell, uh, at the end of the late hostilities, he said, Nicholas, I like you because you seem to have your own teeth. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Giles Brandreth. <laughs> so, Giles, make yourself comfortable. Yep. Um, I alluded to the fact that the first time you did Just a Minute was in 1981, but that you didn't become a regular till 2002. Why was that? Well, I think I came on the programme at all because I already knew Nicholas. We'd met when I was a student at university. I had suggested Giles, I knew him very well, I knew how talented he was, and I'd said to our producer, you know, Giles Brandreth is, is a very clever man, and I think he'd be great in just a minute. And the BBC are very pompous in those days, very much anti BBC then. They said, no, they said, we can't actually have Giles because he sounds too much like Derek Dimmer. <laughs> well, there was a similarity, but I mean, I don't know why. Anyway, that was the reason they didn't ask you earlier. And that was the reason I, I, I did quite a few Just a Minutes then, with Derek and mm. with Kenneth and with Peter Jones and indeed with Sheila. And I loved doing it, but I, I was dropped. And that's the reason I had to go into politics. <laughs> so my years as a Member of Parliament, direct result of me sounding a bit like Derek Nimmo, who was delightful. <laughs> But Nicholas and I stayed friends over the years. He had a chat show on Radio 4 in those days. Look Who's Talking. Look Who's Talking. And I asked you to come on it, and you were wonderful. And we, we talked about pornography, do you remember? That's right, and I asked you to come on. I, I was a member of a pornography committee set up by Lord Longford. This is genuinely true. I really was a member of this pornography committee. I still have the raincoat I bought at the time. <laughs> uh, so we knew one each other well. And we, we'd become friends, but then we became rivals because for a charity that both of us were patrons of, mm. I'd been invited to break the world record for the longest ever after dinner speech. Mm -hmm. And I spoke for five or six hours. <laughs> uh, but you then, you, you then beat my record. That's right. And then I thought I'd better beat his record. So I then spoke for about eight hours. And they, the organizers of this charity, they thought, well, this is going to go on forever. Let's, let's settle this once and for all. So Nicholas and I were invited to go to a London hotel and speak simultaneously in adjacent rooms. <laughs> well, we were separate... very strange, Giles. They, they had a little dinner party with a, a number of people there and an adjudicator That's making right. sure that we didn't uh, deviate or uh, and kept going. Anyway, the point was, we were quite anxious about about going to the loo, weren't we? Well, they telephoned me and they said, Giles has got this anxiety about going to the loo. <laughs> and they said, well, anyway, what we've decided to do is to have you fitted with something, and would you go to a, a chemist in Wigmore Street called John Bell and Croydon? And I went down there, and the chap said, I said, I've come to have something fitted. He said, yes, would you kindly walk this way? And I thought of the old music hall joke, if I walked that way, I wouldn't need the contraption. <laughs> And, um, and I said, I don't know what that is. So I said, can someone help me? And they said, well, it's a sort of astronaut bag, and you strapped it to your leg, and, and, and you could urinate into it, you see. And um... <laughs> this was the challenge. We were both equipped 
with this appliance that apparently... I've never felt so young in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. The appliance is normally used by elderly field marshals taking the salute on chilly That's parade right, grounds. Yeah. Mm. And you can survive for several hours with this. So we were each kitted out with the appliance. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Because we hadn't had a dry run. As... Well, that's not that's <laughs> the French <laughs> I thought, I, well, no, I'll try and tell a joke, and then on the laugh, that's when I'll let go. Uh, but because I was a bit nervous, I told the joke, and there was no laugh, but nonetheless, I, I let go. And it was as I let go that I, I glanced down and saw that the apparatus was snaking its way out of my trouser leg and sort of making, the tube was making its way towards the fire exit. Uh, the, same, the, the very moment this happened to me, there was a, a cry of anguish from the adjacent room, and that was clearly the moment, Nicholas, when your appliance had also yeah, yeah. slipped its mm. moorings, which was the more surprising to me, because obviously uh, yours would have been much smaller we, than mine. We were in adjacent rooms. <laughs> I could hear the laughs you were getting, and you could hear the laughs I was getting, yeah. but we couldn't see it. So this inspired us to keep going, until eventually I got a message to say we're going to call a halt. So at the 11th hour, they called it an honourable draw, and we both went to the Guinness Book of Records as joint holders. But you are more competitive than I am, Giles, and you couldn't stand not holding it. And they said, the Giles... Record, you mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you went for it again, and you got it, and you, you hold the record. I said, no, no, he can have it, he can have it, please. I'm not but I'm go very it. proud to have featured in the Guinness Book of Records alongside Nicholas Parsons, who is in the Guinness Book of Records again nowadays because he is the longest-serving radio performer in the history of broadcasting. Amazing. <laughs> So um, over the years, um, Just a Minute has been recorded in many places outside mm -hmm. of London. We do it mainly in, we do it in London and Edinburgh now. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, we've been to many different places, India, for example. Oh, yes. And uh, we have, as our, as our last guest, somebody who, that's, um, well, this is about a train journey that went horribly wrong on the, on the way to Northumberland, a train journey mm -hmm. that didn't go entirely to plan. To tell us about what happened, will you please welcome to the stage Mr Tony Hawkes! <laughs> So, so I, I've given the yeah. bare bones of it. Do you want to sort of... Uh... I do, I do. Can, can I just, before I answer yes. that, just pay my own personal tribute to, to Nicholas? Oh, it's just it. Well, no, I do want to, because I first went on the show in the early 90s, or the mid-90s, I can't remember when it was, and Nic Nicholas was not, you know, in the f fresh, young... You weren't young then, Nicholas, you know, really. <laughs> <laughs> and look, he is he's still... still he's he... mentioned in the Bible, isn't that right? <laughs> well... But the story was, we used to do just a minute on the road a lot more than we do mm -hmm. now, travelling around the country. And we were going up to Northumberland and uh, a show was in a place called Annick. And I had plenty of time, you know, I was going to be there in plenty of time on the train. And the train, it was, it was a dark November night and uh, the train kept stopping on the way. It was taking, we were running a little bit late. And I just heard this knock on the window, opened my eyes and looked up, and it was Graham Norton. Uh, and, he, and I hadn't actually met Graham uh, before this, but he said, are you Tony? And I said, yes. And he said, I think you should be getting off here. Uh, and, and I didn't realise that we were in the station, so I, I made a charge for, for the door and didn't make it. And the next stop was Edinburgh. <laughs> and, and there was no way I was going to make this show. And so I kicked up a bit of a fuss to the, to the guard and said, you know, well, why didn't you announce we were coming to Elmuth? And he said, well, I can't be everywhere. And I said, well, you don't have to be everywhere. You just have to be behind the microphone. <laughs> uh, and what, this is a tribute to, to Nicholas and how popular the show was, that the people in the carriage heard when I said, I've got to do this recording of just a minute, they started to barrack this guard. <laughs> To such a degree that he stopped the train specially <laughs> at, uh, what's the place just before the border with uh, Scotland? Uh, Berwick on Tweed. Berwick on Tweed. Berwick on Tweed. He stopped it specially and they laid on a car for me to get back. And I think I made it. What, you about, made it just in time, in that's about, right. Yeah. You uh, had one where the buzzers didn't turn up. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, what happened there? The but there where we got to, like somewhere we were in the north of England somewhere, and we, we op they opened up the package and said, We've got no buzzers. So no. what Nicholas came up with this idea, he said, just put your hands up. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and, and, then they, and they put the buzzers in afterwards in the edit and you wouldn't have known the difference. No, really. no. Let's but I had to be so careful to see which hand I went up first. <laughs> <laughs> 
for a lot of people, yeah. Peter Jones is their favourite, and he is for me. I, I, I always loved him, you know. So yeah, how well, did you get on with him? It was for me. I mean, the first one I ever did, I mean, it was quite intimidating. I mean, you started it. Paul came in as the first one of the new gang, and then I was sort of second in. And the first one was Derek Nimmo, and they just, uh, Peter Jones, but they were really not very nice to me. Except, yeah. well, yeah, it was kind of like you were the new boy on the block, and it was like, oh, but Peter was absolutely charming. I hope I was. You too. were as well, Nickers. Thank you you were, yeah, but the other guys, they were horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but once you got a few laughs, and you, then of course they started to be really friendly. You had to earn your spurs, really. But Peter was just, I mean, I just loved his turn of phrase, and he'd sometimes buzz with and just say things like it. I think. I think I did something once, and he just said, he just buzzed me, and he said, that's not very stylish. <laughs> <laughs> and you were very friendly with him oh, as well. I, mean, I knew Peter. I mean, I've known him for years. He was a great personal friend. He, his comic timing was absolutely brilliant. I was in one or two plays with him. He was a, a natural comedy performer. I mean, I think he deserved more than he, uh, from the public than he achieved, because remember, his great... Achievement earlier on was with Peter Ustinov in mm. calling All Directions, mm. the two Peters. It was a brilliant piece. First kind of improvised radio show. Absolutely. Early 50s. And, but Ustinov got all the credit. And Peter was brilliant in it. And uh, uh, there was something about Peter. He didn't have a big personality, but a brilliant comic timing. Mm. Mm. We've got a clip. I'm particularly pleased to get this in because it features Peter Jones. The audio quality <laughs> isn't as perfect as it could be. But here, this is a chance to listen to Peter. Peter, will you begin the next round? The subject, losing money in a telephone box, starting now. Well, it's one of the most frustrating ways of losing money that I know, because unless you write to the people or they take your name and address of the operator, then you can't get the money back. And this does seem to be very unfair. Now, if... Uh, Kenneth Williams, Charles. Deviation, he's telling the audience, send things to Charles, if you're not true, you simply get the operator and say that you've lost your money, she gets you the call free. I mean, it's rubbish to yeah, say... but you can't right actually get your money back. That's what he said. Mm, you can't you get your money back. You want your call, don't you? Yes, but you may not get your call, and then you still can't get your money back. Well, anyway, I should have the subject. He was very dreary about it, and I think that's... <laughs> <kind of it. laughs> I don't think he was actually deviating, so, Peter... Well, I, I admit to being dreary, but that's never been any hindrance on this case. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Hall. Thank you. I think perhaps on behalf of everybody that's ever been on Just a Minute, what a superb job you do as a chairman. It, it, oh. it, you, you have really been the star of the last 50 years. So I congratulate you and I'm proud to call you my friend. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Parson. <laughs> Paul Merton and Nicholas Parsons were talking about 50 years of just a minute with Sheila Hancock, Giles Brandreth, John Lloyd and Tony Hawkes. The producer was Victoria Lloyd. It was a BBC Studios production.